Hi, I'm Linda Katz Wilner. Welcome to the hard facts about soft skills. Today we have with us Lourdes Billingsley. Lourdes is a mentor, a public speaker, and a teacher. And her business is Life is Your Teacher. I'm so thrilled to have Lourdes here because when I met her, I knew that her area of expertise would be excellent for this series. Welcome, Lourdes. It's nice to see you here. Thanks for having me, Linda. Lourdes, tell us a little bit about your background and what you've done in your career that gets you to this point. Well, um, I really have had the pleasure over the past 30 years to work with a variety of different people in different settings. And as you know, I have a master's degree mm -hmm. in sports psychology. And I started off my career in doing peak performance work with professional and non-professional athletes. I also worked at the premier ballet academy, the Kirov Academy of Ballet in Washington, DC, where I worked with dancers in, to support them in their personal lives, as well as in attaining the best that they could as dancers. And um, you also know that I have a Montessori mm -hmm. certificate. And so when my daughter was born, I decided to fall back on that training and combine it with my psychology and to work as a teacher and a mentor and a counselor in school environments. And so I did that for many years. And I uh, now that my daughter's older and she doesn't need me there as much, I'm shifting back into working as a teacher and as a mentor. And right now I'm working with clients around the idea that life is your teacher. So that becomes interesting. And we've had conversations about this on how this will relate to people in the workplace, because that's the audience we have here today. Mm -hmm. That people are looking how they can apply all of this information to help with the soft skills, particularly in the workplace, but of course in your day-to-day -day life as well. Lourdes, you talk about life is your teacher. How does that apply to the workforce when we talk about soft skills and the skills that we need to function well in our work life? Using life as your teacher is the perfect way to develop your soft skills. Because when we're developing our soft skills, what we're really saying to ourselves is, what do I need to look at inside of myself and improve so I can be more effective in my life, in my relationships, in the workplace? So life as your teacher is about learning about who you are. It's about taking life's experiences and working with them in a positive way. Like here's a perfect example. Let's say you have a difficult boss and you have to have a challenging conversation mm -hmm. with that person. This is an opportunity for you to grow. So instead of becoming intimidated instead of worrying having sleepless nights you can approach your relationship with your boss in a way that is going to serve you and empower you and when we work with these lessons if we see our this difficult boss as an opportunity to learn then we can kind of take the problem solving to a whole other level mm -hmm and make lemonade out of lemons. Basically. Exactly, exactly. And I'm assuming that would be similar to toxic people in the workplace, not just your boss, but your team members. Many people have that challenge that they know they can perform well, but there are people around them that may be sabotaging them. Right. How do they deal with that, or how do you help them deal with that? Well, it's, kind of, it's interesting because I've actually been working with this with a specific client of mine. And what we came to see uh, in his particular situation is that a lot of the, the people in work that, at work that were presenting problems for him or challenges were reminding him of his parents. Hmm. So we started to do that important work around our relationship with our parents. And he started to look at, well, how did I feel disempowered in my relationship with my parents? And how do I uh, correct that for myself? Because our past experiences, as we all know, really shape us. Mm -hmm. And when we can pinpoint a past experience and work with it in a way where we shift the way in which we perceive ourselves based on that experience, then we can have a, a whole new mindset about who we are and what we're capable of doing. And so that's what using life as your teacher allows you to do. So here's something very interesting. 
When you hear them talk about hard skills, those are the competencies, the things that you learn, the programs you know how to work on when you get to a job, all of those technical skills, which are all very learned. And then some of the articles say that the soft skills are your emotional intelligence, and you can't learn that. What do you think about that? I disagree with that completely. You know, life is your teacher, so we're mm -hmm. gonna, I'm going to keep saying that. And so we are, I believe that we're here to learn, that our purpose in life is to learn, to learn not just about how to do things in life, you know, math, science, or how to get a, you know, a beautiful home, or how to make a lot of money, or prestige, and those types of things. Those are the things that we do in life. But we're also here to learn how to be and how to become. And to say that a person can't develop their heart or develop their kindness and their love and their compassion and their humility <clears throat> is really to make a very negative statement about humanity mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Because my belief is that we're here to do those very things. And that, I know you have an ebook. And you mm -hmm. talk about the intention for your growth and how to approach it. How does that relate to the soft skills? Well, I think at any level, if, if a person wants to develop soft skills, meaning they want to become a better person, they want to cultivate themselves to become the best person that they can be, you have to have an intention for that. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to look at yourself and say, okay, this is where I need to grow. These are the things that I'm doing that aren't working. You need to have some humility to kind of step back and say, I'm not doing such a great job in my relationships with people. And then when we take that step back and we identify what it is that needs to develop and change, then we create an intention around that. Mm -hmm. So it's like you say, I see that I need to be more honest with the people at work. Mm -hmm. My intention is to feel safe and comfortable being honest and to then do it. And then once we have an intention like that, we're putting it out there and we're connecting into the space of what creates things in life, mm -hmm. right? And then we can manifest it. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of intention. And you said that you do work with soft skills. And in some ways you said even the softer skills or the deeper skills. Tell, tell us a little bit about the range of soft skills that you address. Okay. So in just in doing my research around soft skills, because I know it's kind of a new mm -hmm. uh, topic for me, mm -hmm. the way in which it's being held. What I saw is that, you know, a lot of soft skills are based around what, are still around what we do, how we communicate, how we relate, um, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And my work takes everything a little bit deeper because what I do is, and what I do with my clients is we work on things such as forgiveness, humility, compassion, faith, not religious faith, but having faith that things are gonna work out. Mm -hmm. And also self-worth. Because our self-worth, I would say, is the core of my work. It's knowing that you have value as a person just because you're alive and you're breathing. And that value is what is the foundation of all of the soft skills. And it's the foundation to how good a listener you can be and how good a public speaker you can be. Exactly. Because so much of what, you, and we'll talk a little more about that, but so much of what you're saying relates so closely to what you need to be a good communicator. And that leads me to something we talked about with active listening. Mm -hmm. Because I've taught that for years and active listening was always show somebody how you're a good listener. Keep the eye contact, lean forward, nod your head, maybe say, mm-hmm. And then mm -hmm. I, we started realizing that's not good enough. That's showing, like you said, it, it's what you're putting out there, but how are you really feeling? And I came across this Chinese symbol for active listening, and it was fascinating because the different characters, as many Chinese symbols have different types of characters there, one is for your ears for listening. One is for your eyes for watching. And then there's a line that makes you have undivided attention. 
And all of that's important, and I've taught that for years. But what I love about this symbol is it also shows your mind for thinking and your heart for feeling. And that gets us more towards that empathetic listening, which is now more important. And you hear more about that now than active listening. Mm -hmm. So tell me about listening with your heart. I love that Chinese mm -hmm. symbol. When I, I saw your presentation and I thought, well, this is, this is it. This is mm -hmm. what we all need to start understanding. And which really is, they're talking about the integration of our mind and our heart. And so it's about communicating from our hearts. But let's be really clear about the heart. And when I say communicate from your heart, it's not about communicating sentiment. It really is about being in a very present, peaceful, compassionate, loving space where you're actually taking the person in mm -hmm. when you listen to them. You're not thinking about the next thing mm -hmm. that you're going to say. You're not just like looking at them and nodding and full of anxiety. You're like receiving the person mm -hmm. in, a, in a really beautiful, loving and compassionate way. So like when I think about Gandhi and what he did, right? He was a man of peace and he didn't have peace as an idea or as an agenda. The man was living and breathing it in his whole heart and his entire being which is why he was able to face an army. Mm -hmm. And because he was holding that, he was, it was a vibration, it was a feeling in his heart, he was able to move forward with so much confidence mm -hmm. and knowing that he was going to be okay. Now he's a master at that. Mm -hmm. And you know, for all of us, we wanna start learning how to live in our hearts and get a sense of, what that feels like beyond sentiment. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're talking also about being present in the moment, not being rehearsed, not completely memorizing what you want to say, but just being in there in that moment so that you can engage and you can listen, but you can speak what you're feeling. Exactly. And I think that's what's missing. That's when, when people don't have the soft skills, it seems like that's what's missing. You're exactly right. I agree with you. That is what's missing. Mm -hmm. And in our world today, we have a lot of pressure mm -hmm. to hit the nail on the head, produce results, show up. There's no space. There's no space for us to pause and be in, a, in the silence to actually see what's going to arise. So what we share comes through with this powerful authenticity. And our authenticity lives inside of ourselves. It's not mm -hmm. something we can get through a training. We get it through our understanding of our own self-worth. And tying back in with life is your teacher, when we can work with what comes our way and problem solve and, and, and use the lessons then we start to reveal ourselves inside of ourselves and then we are expressing something with so much ease and joy. And this sounds so much like what I teach people with public speaking. Many people get up and rush to talk and it's all about the presence and the stillness. And I think the quietness and stillness is often what exudes confidence. Right. Not speaking real quickly and being so ready and rushing to do it. So I'm hearing a lot of that in the way you describe it, and that fits perfectly with somebody who has to get up and give a speech, have a job interview, run a meeting, mm -hmm. all of these, that that quiet place shows confidence and allows people to process and to think. And so that leads me to some exercises. What are some exercises that you use with your clients that would be helpful to use in the workplace? I have a primary exercise that I like to use. And uh, it, this, this conversation, this piece of the conversation is reminding me of what a friend said to me once, which was a, was a question actually. And he says, Lourdes, do you feel comfortable in your own skin? And the answer was no, mm. I don't. And so I, I, real, I thought, yeah, I, I wanna feel more comfortable mm -hmm. in my own skin. I wanna be able to relax wherever I am. 
And what I used to develop that for myself is a very simple practice around grounding and being in my body and relaxing in my body. This is the very, very first thing that I teach all of my clients. Because if we're not relaxed and grounded in our bodies, and then the second step would be centering ourselves in our hearts, we don't have access to ourselves. We only have access to our mind, mm -hmm. which isn't really a reliable tool mm -hmm. for matters of soft skills or matters of the heart. Because our mind is trained in, based on our past. Mm -hmm. And so when we're grounded and relaxed and centered in our hearts, we can have faith and trust that what we need to say is gonna come out and that everything's gonna be okay. Wonderful. Do you do breathing with any of this? Do you work on breathing at all? I do. Okay. It's a very big part of it. So we often hold our breath. Mm -hmm. You know, people will hold their breath all the time. So practicing grounding can't be done in an isolated way. So it's something that we need to be mindful of throughout our day. And that grounding and breathing and connecting with ourselves through our breath is something that we can do all day long. And really, mm -hmm. we should be doing all mm -hmm. day long. So breathing is very important because it brings us into that quiet, more peaceful, focused state. I love it. That's exactly what I do with my clients. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Now, you do have the degree in peak performance, and that's when we first met, that's what I jumped right onto mm -hmm. because I'm fascinated by it, and peak performance is exactly what you need to teach people with public speaking or speaking up at a meeting. What does it mean to you to get into the zone? Being in the zone really is connected to grounding and mm -hmm. connecting to my breath and centering in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's when I start to really feel comfortable in my own skin. And then something happens. I'm like, I'm connected to something larger than myself, larger than my mind, that then is taking me to where I need to go. Many years ago, I swam from Alcatraz to San Francisco. Mm, oh my goodness. <laughs> and then I rode my bike 15 miles to the town nearby. And then I ran 13 miles from the valley over the mountains. And it was the most challenging thing I ever did. But it was a beautiful practice. It was a beautiful lesson around being grounded, being centered in my heart, having faith, and knowing that I can make it, mm -hmm. and working, actively working with noticing my thoughts that were self-deprecating. Like, you can't do this. You're not mm -hmm. going to make it. Oh, I'm going to die you know, and just ignoring that and staying with the intention that I had, which was to end the race. Okay, and then my next talk, my next question for you was, what about that, that positive self-talk? You just spoke about the mm -hmm. negative. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what we need to do for positive self-talk to help us through experiences. Well, here's the secret to positive self-talk. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it Explain doesn't work <laughs> because we can't just tell ourselves mm -hmm. that we're okay. Mm -hmm. We can't tell ourselves that from up here, from up here in our mind. It's something we have to believe. So that's when positive self-talk actually works, when we become what we want ourselves to become. And so what a lot of people do with positive self-talk is they take the good words and they put them on top of the bad words, mm -hmm. of the negative things that we're saying. And so what I'm suggesting and what I do with my clients is, okay, we know you're, you have inherent self-worth. So in a way, you don't need that positive self-talk if we know we have value. We're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, mm -hmm. though. But we have these negative beliefs about ourselves. When we know what those are, that's when we can confidently eradicate those beliefs and then hold an intention for ourselves to be who we want to be. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different than just giving yourself a pep talk. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. And I think of positive self-talk very often with public speaking mm -hmm. where I encourage people to think about, well, 
I, I was asked to speak because I know something. And that's a little that's bit different. different from what yeah. you're talking about. So boost yourself up to remind yourself of your exactly. attributes. But I understand what you're saying. You can't just put them on top of negative feelings. That's right. But we often, or I tell people, don't think about what shouldn't happen. You know, don't worry about saying, um, focus on being fluent and pausing. Exactly. And so that's what I mean by think about what you want to happen. Don't focus on what you fear happening. And exactly. That, that's how I look at positive self-talk. Yes. But I think we're talking about... We're talking about the, the same thing. The same thing. thing, but different situations Different for situations. That. And so... Uh, I'm saying, let's take it a little deeper. So we've mm -hmm. had this conversation before. Mm -hmm. We've kind of come to this place where it's like, well, how good is positive self-talk? Well, it's it's a great thing. It can, it can take you to a certain place, right? It can mm -hmm. get your mind off of the negative stuff. But we also want to clear out the beliefs that are holding us back. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people use positive self-talk as an overlay. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that we're addressing what it is that's holding us back. What are those mm -hmm. negative thoughts? What are those beliefs mm -hmm. that I have? And then once we find that belief, then we create a corresponding positive intention or belief that directly mm -hmm. relates to that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very powerful way mm -hmm. to work. Very powerful. And, and I know that I often say to clients, sometimes you can fake it until you make it. And what I mean by that is exude the confidence. Make sure you're thinking about how you're right. coming across. But if you really feel miserable, that's coming through. <laughs> exactly. But ideally, if you can show in your body language and how you mm -hmm. carry yourself that you're confident, sometimes it does work inward afterwards. It's not as good as what you're saying, but it's a strategy to help you feel more confident when you start to look confident and speak in a confident way, you start to believe that. I think working with both of those mm -hmm. is really important. And this is what I really love about what I'm seeing with your body language right mm -hmm. now, is that you're saying you want people to exude confidence. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, you're saying be in your heart. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? And I often say to people when they talk, make sure your heart is facing the person you're speaking to because exactly. that is more yeah. authentic and more sincere. Yeah. So let's talk about something else okay. that, that fascinated me. You told me you had the Montessori training. Mm -hmm. And Montessori training is for teachers working with children. But when we talked about it, there was a connection on how you can use those same principles mm -hmm. working with managers or just people in the workplace or leaders or CEOs. So tell us a little bit about that. You know what's really beautiful about Montessori is that as educators, we're taught that every child knows how to find their way in their life and, and in their work and in what they're doing. So as a teacher, we are expert observers. That's our job. Mm -hmm. We observe the child and we see where they're headed and we allow them to essentially unfold. We don't put any restrictions on them in terms of what they can and cannot do in terms of their interests. Of course, there's boundaries, right? But we allow the child to unfold and we're holding space for them essentially from our hearts where we're saying, I know that you have this deep inner sense about what's right for you. And we work with them to trust it, to follow it, and we support them in developing it. If I had a manager like that, mm -hmm. I'd be in heaven, right? right? But not every manager is not like every that. manager so, is like that. So, what are some tips that managers can do to make them more like that and encourage the growth and the creativity of the people on their team, and not just direct them to the way that they want it to be? Yeah, right. So, this is the the second piece that I love about Montessori. So, Maria Montessori gave a directive to all Montessori teachers, which is that if you're going to help these children in this mission of supporting them to unfold and discover themselves, you have to work on yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to know who you are. You have to know what your limitations are. You have to understand how you might be controlling mm -hmm. the child. So my advice to managers is to take on life as your teacher. <laughs> Know mm -hmm. yourself, develop your own soft skills, and look at what it is that you do that keeps people back. Mm -hmm. How are you controlling or mm -hmm. do you get angry? Do you 
are you resentful? Like, what do you do that doesn't allow your employees to shine? And if you begin there, everything will start to fall in place. You'll learn how to have patience. You'll learn how to have compassion, understanding. You'll be able to speak more directly and honestly because your agenda isn't yourself. It is about growing other people. Hopefully. Hopefully, Hopefully. right? That would, that would be the, my mm -hmm. first tip. And, and it sounds like even if you're working with a manager, they need to know what their intention is because maybe their intentions aren't what they should be. Exactly right. right. So they have to identify them. That's right. Lourdes, we could talk for hours and we have in the past. So I know <laughs> there's so much that we can talk about and so much that resonates with the, just the soft skill, not just the soft skills, but how we need to be every day in the workplace, in our relationships socially, and also with ourselves. So I thank you so much for offering all of your expertise today. It's so much information that I know so many people can apply. So thanks for being part of this interview. It's been wonderful speaking with you. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. My pleasure too.